This is Taco Incidents, an unconventional masterclass where we learn secrets of breakthrough culture, brand experience, and human connection from the most brilliant leaders, all while we're on the search for the perfect taco. I met up with Sydney Tetro for tacos at Rico Cocina in Salt Lake City, Utah. She's built her entire career in businesses around creating these superhero moments for customers and her team every day. A former Disney entrepreneur in residence, she is the CEO of Brandless and founder and president of Women Tech Council, where she is impacting generations by empowering young women to pursue careers in business and tech. I wanted to learn why she believes in the power of culture, brand experience, and human connection, what she does to create it, and how it's helped her thrive. All over tacos. It really doesn't get much better than this. It smells really good. It does smell really good. It's here. like all in yeah. like you can't. Yeah, you like, walk in. It's <laughs> like a full sensory experience. And I think it's because you have the back and the front, right? Uh huh. Yeah. We're doing exactly. full into the experience together. <laughs> well, and yeah, like we 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 stepped back there and like looked at like the whole factory where they're making all these yep. tortillas for here, but for for a lot of other restaurants in Salt Lake. So. I think it's a really cool expansion strategy, yeah. right? That you. Um, and interestingly enough, lots of our entrepreneurs that, you know, where we met in the government yeah, yeah, yeah. room, they think about that too, right? It's like you have this restaurant and it's got so much capacity. And so then he was just really smart on thinking of growth, yeah. right? Like how do I take all this cool stuff that I'm doing and put it into community, yeah. which I love. It's so cool. I am so excited to talk with you and to hear, hear a lot of the backstory of uh, what what makes well, thank you. Sid Tetro th- Tech. Yeah, this is the questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, it's, I, I we we met um, when I was part of Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, yep. which is an amazing program. It's an amazing and program. you were uh, like just a captivating, engaging teacher. And <laughs> I'm like, I have got to find out more <laughs> about what, like, I feel like there's so many things that, that, that resonated so deeply with me and, and my path, but also what, um, what you believe in from a business perspective and, and how uh, you've made focus on like your, your marketing and your customer experience and this like all encompassing right. brand experience has been like such a uh, hallmark of who you are. And so I was just like so drawn to that and I'm so excited <laughs> that we're finally sitting Me down too. and having a chance to, to, uh, to hear more. So you gotta, do, I'll let you go first okay. with the guac. Um, it looks amazing. It does look good. The so, salsa looks really good too. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like it's chunky. You got all sorts of stuff in it. Um, Might be really these hot. guys do it right. Are you like really hot? Spicy. They're Spicier really hot. the better. Yep. <laughs> I think they make their own it's chips. Hot. For Are sure they hot? make their own trip. It's spicy. It's not like mm-hmm. crazy, crazy. Good flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so I don't even know why. Oh, Disney. Yeah. So, um, so you were entrepreneur in residence. There. I was. Yeah, and uh, Disney has this like legendary um, reputation, mm-hmm. obviously, for everything from they call each other cast members, being yep. on stage, the entire culture, like the entire culture, and this whole uh, completely. Uh, immersive brand experience that yep. Walt Disney himself like started. Absolutely. So, what's it like from the inside? What it's, is this like? It was one of the coolest things I've ever done yeah. to have an opportunity to work there. So, you know, I'd done tech companies before and was coming off a company and one of the companies previously I'd been chief marketing officer and a really good colleague of mine was chief technology officer. And he was his mentor. So he's one of the smartest guys I know. His name's mm. Tom No. He has his PhD in computational biophysics from Harvard. Okay. And Tom got recruited to go help um, create Disney research at yeah. the Disney company. And so Ed Capnell, with, with the acquisition of Pixar, so Pixar had had this lab strategy, which said there's problems that the company's going to face over the next decade that are technology-driven. Let's go have brilliant researchers thinking about this. Mm. And so when Pixar was acquired over a little bit of time, they decided to create these labs that are tied to really brilliant academics to go figure out how you solve problems the Disney company faces huh. over the next 10 years, specifically around technology. So think about things like robotics, AI, computer vision, yeah. 3D, yeah. you know, data analytics, all sorts of things that are take a long time for us to solve from a technology perspective. So they created the lab, and Tom went in to come go help them run the lab. And he'd been there a couple of years, and I was coming off a company, and I 
and Tom and I were talking, and he's like, you know, said, I'm about ready to launch this entrepreneur in residence program. You want to come down and, like, do this? And I was like, that sounds kind of interesting. Like, when else am I going to get that chance? So I fly down on this weekend. I meet with the team, and I come back, and Tom's like, so if you want to come do it, it's yours. Okay. And, and then these are the caveats. He's like, look, it's the first time we've ever done this. We don't know exactly what it looks like. We don't know where, how long it lasts. We don't know exactly what it's structured. I can't even tell you where you'd be a year from now, but you want to come. I was like, I guess this sounds okay. I guess I'll jump in. And I was like, just the opportunity to go be immersed in the, the Disney culture and understand yeah. what that is and an opportunity to do also things that I really like in technology. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'm Great. just going to go do that. Yeah, super so fascinating. We right? lined up this project, and over the course of five years, I got to work inside of research. So Disney Research sits in Imagineering. Yeah. And in Imagineering, and we had a really unique vantage point because labs are over all of the business lines. ESPN, ABC, studios, theme parks, interactive, wow. animation. So you had the opportunity to really interact and think about technology across every single business line. Wow. For me personally, I, I think one of the coolest things I, I got the opportunity to do is really understand how a lot of times as marketers, we hear people talk about stories, mm. right? And you hear about messaging pitches. Yeah. But at Disney, I gained this great appreciation that it wasn't just about like how you write the right message. It was about this journey that you take someone who's your customer on and how they kind of emotionally tie into that and the authenticity of that story and the relationship that's created by it that ultimately determines the connection. And at Disney, it's just everywhere, right? From when I launched a bunch of products at Star Wars Weekends. Oh, wow. And I know Star Wars, right? I've watched all the shows, but yeah, yeah. I had to, <laughs> in one of the instances, we, we had created the carbon freezing chamber. And so guests Han would come Solo. and you could become frozen in carbon, like Han Solo. <laughs> and so we were creating That's the carbon awesome. freezing chamber. It was super amazing. We who had, doesn't like, want to do right, that? Who doesn't want to do this? Who doesn't want like, to do lights that? lights and fog machines. And yeah, like, yeah. I learned all about like the questions, like which fog machine should work in this building? Sure. Um, but then we had to create this whole storyline that mm. made sense for guests that stay, had to stay like authentic to what would have happened in Star Wars. So there's this real attention to like just because it might be cool, if it doesn't make sense in context of the story or what the customer or the guest would expect, then you don't do it. It just becomes part of who you yeah, are. And yeah. you get these experiences where you meet so many different people across the company and then you're, you're just... You, it becomes part of what you understand that you didn't understand before. That the reason that you should make certain decisions on product or customer or brand are because of what they enable in the future. And I think that's really, it's just a really powerful thing. So my mind really shifted from, I've been, a, I'm, I mean, I came out of computer science, right? So I build product, but I knew how to market. But my ability to become better at it and truly understand what it meant to create transformative experiences changed when I went to Disney. Mm. And that was one of my favorite things. Plus, I got to work in tech, and I love all the technology stuff along the way. Um, so you said that that, like, that kind of, you know, a little bit of a paradigm shift for you mm -hmm. as far as, like, from either from a uh, marketing perspective, experience perspective, customer journey. Yep. How that, how has that influenced what, what, even what you're doing today now? For me, it's now become just a core thread through really the way I think and the, even the types of companies that I've built. And when I came out of Disney, I started a 3D printing company, yeah. which was a personalization platform. And we, you know, you can become Iron Man, right? We take your 3D face which, of your skin. You just like throw it out like that's no big <laughs> deal. But like a personalization platform to allow people to become Iron Man. Yes. I mean, that's like, you don't get much more personal or even aspirational right. or, or like, it's just... Then yeah. taking, because as, as people, it was the most fun thing about 3D Plus Me was that we got to work with all the biggest brands in the world yeah. and help people become part of the stories they love. Because people love stories, right? We, we watch superhero movies because we, we really love the things that they aspire to. And we're like, I, like I that's that. great. Yeah, that's why we buy the merchandise. You know, the opportunity, which was a totally different experience to say, how come for just a small moment in time? Do I put you in the shoes of Iron Man? Yeah. And you see yourself exactly as that. Because today, or at previous, you know, you might buy your shirt or the socks or your cape Halloween or style, whatever. Right? Yeah. Um, and anything that represents that. But when you see yourself on a like, 3D printed figurine as Captain America or as a toy, so Hasbro built a toy line for us. We're like, no, that's actually me. And the cool thing about when we built that is the software that we built took you into this moment. So even as we were building our scanning stations, like, I want this to feel... It was my Disney days coming up. Yeah. This immersive moment, like you step into this world and you see yourself transform to Iron Man. Yeah. And so after you get your face scan, there was this whole experience where you were focused that 
you saw yourself become Iron Man. Where where did you have these booths? You had at, at the Super Bowl at World yeah, Series. Yeah, so we so we at- we did agreements with Marvel and Star Wars, and then we also did Disney stores. We did Halo, Assassin's Creed, the NFL, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer. Yeah. So depending on which one, you'd find us in different places. We did partnerships with Walmart, Target, and Toys R Us. So you could find them. And in, in very many of those across the country. Again, Times Square in the Toys R Us that used to be there, there was a permanent install. There was one in FAO Schwartz. So anyone who came through became their favorite superhero, really. So the Super Bowl, same thing, right? Because at the Super Bowl, you got to pick your favorite team. You scan your face. You pick your favorite team. You put your name on the jersey. You put your number on the jersey. And the, and the 3D printed figurine that you'll get says Super Bowl 50 right on it. Wow. And so that's really cool, right? As a moment in time. Like I have, we have many. Of these I'm in my sure. House. <laughs> and so I had launched and then um, we had been at Comic-Con. Okay. Comic-Con is like where the line was three hours long. Of course. Which was perfect. I understand. There's yes. still a video out there of the Marvel.com guys becoming their characters yeah. and like filming the entire yeah. thing. Um, so I realized after that, and then right after that, I had a conversation with Walmart. And Walmart said, he said, Superhero September is coming. This is, so this is the end of the June. Like, Superhero September is coming. How many Walmarts can we get in for Superhero September? Like, Ooh, this is a really good question. And I was like, well, how many can you pay for? <laughs> and then I said, you know, I think I need a product that's a cheaper price point. So I picked up, we didn't know anyone at Hasbro yet, but you need Hasbro's partnership to develop toy lines. So I pick up the phone and we figure out the guy at Hasbro and we call them and we say, look, Walmart wants us to launch in two months for Superhero September. I think I need a toy line. Will you guys partner with us? And they said, yes. And we launched in 60 days, a toy line into Walmart. Crazy, huh? And it was really well, those fun. Those two like behemoth companies. I know, <laughs> unbelievable. That's great. And it was, re- but it was really cool. So then we started having a toy line. We did wow. the first version, and then Hasbro built a special toy line specifically for personalization across Star Wars and Marvel. Oh my gosh! Oh yeah, this is good. I know, you can never really have enough luck. Mm-hmm. Um, man, this looks really good. It, it does look really good. It smells amazing. So, uh, like, at a higher level, why do you think the 3D printing of Iron Man or of Princess Leia or whoever it is, mm-hmm. why do you think these things are so successful and resonate so deeply with people. Like, why is that something that's, mm-hmm. why is it something that's a big deal? You know, it, it's the, it, it's all in that that hero story, right? Like we have, I think, inside of us, this, this kind of aspirational desire to do like good things and, you know, um, fight for the good things. Like that's just kind of in the nature of people. And we have these representations that happen in all sorts of forms you know, forms today. I think it's super interesting that like Black Panther, mm. you know, is because it's such a fabulous show. And it's in that mm. same genre where there's just great messages that come through in the story, right? About the human spirit and survival and whatever the forms they take in. And so I think and, and our kids take them too, even in just smaller forms, right? We identify with some characters and something that creates this aspirational desire that mm-hmm. we associate with. And then we beca- we love those stories. Right. And then and those stories become a representation of maybe ways we think or how we want to interact or different yeah. types of things. And so when you see opportunities to put yourself in that storyline, kind of create that translation a little bit stronger, it's really powerful for people. Oh, yeah. And, and it's in any in any genre, any you yeah. know place that you see that. And we oftentimes see it in things like superheroes or you know, certain Star Wars characters or, you know, whatever those things are. And so um, I think it resonated so well because for that moment, they could see who, who they are. We had one, I had a friend of mine who brought um, one of his, his brother through who had, um, I, think he, I think he was down, he had Down syndrome. Mm-hmm. And they always called his brother a superhero his whole life. Mm-hmm. And his, his, his brother thought of himself as that. Uh-huh. And then when he went through the scan and then he saw himself on screen as Iron Man, he broke down. He's like, this is, and his brother broke down too. And he said, this is how we see you all of the time. Wow. Right. And so there are these moments where I think it's that message where Mm. we already kind of think of ourselves as that. And it's just this really cool way to create an extension of dreams and aspirations and, and even just a little of acknowledgement that you are that person, that you, you have that same potential and can become that. And I, I really loved the moments that we had 
to see those transformations. In Toys R Us one time we had a young kid who came through who was a burn victim. And so, you know, he had the scars that were on his face, but it all disappears when you become when you get through the scanner, right? And so he it was at this other moment where he saw his like this state that is how he sees himself too. Which is which are really cool things. That that's the part I love about really important stories, right? And what I think and translate that to customer experience and digital transformation and all the techie terms. Yeah, um, the reason today we compete on customer experience from from companies and brands is because it's you're looking for that realness. You're looking for things that feel more than just a transaction, but feel like a true value exchange. And sometimes those are really moving, like things like that, and sometimes they're smaller. But in the world today as we operate, and I see this in all of the CIOs and with all of the big companies that I get an opportunity to work with today, is at the core of what we do, we compete on customer experience. Mm -hmm. And the better we are at understanding customers and motivations and trying to do the right things in them, then the better those brands have an association. It was also one of my favorite things about Disney is they care first and foremost about guest satisfaction. And everything operates underneath that. And they do it um, because they understand when you form that relationship, the lifetime impact of that is so much better than any momentary decision you make counter to that. I watched one of my old nannies go, go to Disney a couple about a year ago, and they had taken their like one-year-old son for his first time. They're halfway through the day, and he throws up everywhere. And of course, she brings a change of clothes for him, but not for her, right, and everything. So you're now faced with this moment of like leaving the park. And if you leave at that moment, you don't ever come back. It's too hard. Yeah. And you might not come back to Disney for a very long time. Someone saw her. They stopped her, and they're like, let us just help you. So they went in, helped get new clothes, um, you know, totally change the experience. They stay in the park, and from there on, for the rest of their lives, they will become advocates for that experience. And Forever. that's what um, customer experience represents, right? Yeah. The ability to create experiences that are that positive for people that, in our companies that we're building, create lifetime brands and lifetime relationships that persist. It's how we build friendships. It's how we know people, right? And, and the core of the companies that we want to work with do the same. Yeah, and so what is that? What what does that look like? How how do they, um, you know, how do they measure an ROI on something like that? Like how how is that how is that quantified? So the brilliant part about that one is, I think that one's really quantifiable because either you got you know the value of her family when she goes in. So let's say they spent five hundred bucks to go in, um, and she never comes back, or now you have her as a lifelong member of Disney. Where I'll guarantee you, every year they're going to go back going to take every one of their families, yep. they're going to start spending more, and if you look at the lifetime value of someone from one momentarily experience that might have cost Disney a hundred bucks, yeah. right? you now for sure have a lifelong relationship that you really probably can't monetize. It, I mean, you can't quantify it completely because it's going to go into movies, it's going to go into merchandise that you buy outside <laughs> the parks, it's going to go to theme park totally. experiences, right? It just expands because your affinity towards what they did for you is yeah. now so grounded in relationship. But the reason and the way the most comp successful companies are focusing on what investments they make that change customer experience to make it better mm. for their customers. Because, you know, we're now in the land of like AI and we can yeah. predict things and totally. you get 5G networks out there and the speed of real-time enterprise is just really accelerating. Yeah. But what I get to spend all day doing is building customer experiences that align with the customer's value exchange to build relationship. Mm -hmm. And every time that we build those and we watch those deploy, the, um, the places where people are spending their money are the places where the customer um, is a better experience because of that and will create more longevity. Yeah. And, and you know, I think you're seeing those massive pivots in retail, which has had huge amounts of disruption. Oh, right? tremendous. We're completely yeah. changing market landscape. The, um, that customer experience focus is key to winning in those markets. Because if you don't understand, you know, customer experience has dramatically changed for or purchasing and delivery in the last two years, yeah. right? And so you look at companies like Amazon, right, who's built coming in and they're, you know, thinking about like, how do I give you instantaneous delivery and two-hour <laughs> delivery and all of this thing, but they're bringing infrastructure. So then you look at other companies like the Walmarts and the Targets of the world, well, 90% of Americans live within 10 miles of those stores. Yeah. But their challenge is different. They have distributed inventory. And so now they have a different problem on two-hour delivery where they might have a close to you, but it might be in like six different places. <laughs> and so what they're getting forced to do is to really think about 
how does the experience for the customer stay the same, even though our operations have to change? Yeah. And so when they focus on that, you've, you've watched those two companies been able to successfully counter what's been happening as yeah. Amazon, but it's driven by experience. It's driven by the fact that you need same day delivery, yeah. that you need pickup, that your access to distributed yeah. inventory comes quicker, that it's mobile friendly, you yeah. know, that all of those things start to change. And as they make that happen, that's creating the, the ability for them to huh. ha- create stabilization. What do you, since you're having all of these like like high level conversations, uh, what beyond like any sort of return on investment, beyond profitability, what's the driving force here? Um, I think that's where the market, that's where everyone is required to go. Like, we all compete on experience, right? We compete even in coming in here, right? Yeah. It's in it's an experience that you're looking for. You're looking for not just amazing food, but an opportunity to have an environment yeah. that is the experience that you need. Yeah. And so all the stats, like if every report that you read today says 90% of companies today believe they're competing on experience and that customers are willing to pay a premium for experience in today's market. Yeah. I think you see that in your churro business. Absolutely. Right? 100%. I mean, it's, it's completely driven by the yeah. same idea that yeah. you're creating a different food experience and people are paying a different price for that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and yeah, it's interesting, you know, they'll go, oh my gosh, but I get a churro like this at Costco for a dollar, and you're selling me a churro like this for three dollars? Like, yeah, and you're gonna love it. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's really good, yeah. and it's filled with happiness, <laughs> exactly. and our team will ring the cowbell for you when it's your birthday, and. Right, and it's this, and in fairness, if you're looking for the one dollar churro, it's a different experience that they're totally. going after than mm-hmm. that, and it's also okay, right? And totally. so it also like starts to, I think, segment markets, mm-hmm. right? And so you say, which is the same thing, it was even true in our, our 3D printing business. If, you, if it's not, if you aren't, if that storyline and that experience isn't as powerful as you, then you're just not gonna spend the money on it. Right. right? And, and that's okay, but I just think the stat that's really interesting that says, we're willing to pay a premium for experience. And companies are recognizing that. And so if they don't invest in experience, they're actually losing market share. Yeah. And what's fascinating to me about what you're doing is that you're kind of saying, now you're using technology to return this like highly personalized, humanized experience. Yep. And that's a real, I think that's a really important part, right? Is that as technology replaces certain interactions, it doesn't change the fact that we need kind of this other side of it. Yeah. I also think it's more an enabler. Exactly. Yeah. And if you think about it that way, you deploy it differently. Mm. When, when people talk all the time about, you know, robots taking all of our jobs, they're going to take jobs that make sense for that to happen. Mm-hmm. But there are this whole other tier of things that they can't take and that you can't replace. And, Absolutely. And I think that that's interesting. I think it all actually plays into the fourth industrial revolution, right? Yeah. This we were so digital for so long, and now the integration of digital and physical worlds, yeah. right? It, there's parts it's, where that, that human part, sometimes it's just intelligence in those spaces, but it is the fact that I might not order my entire world online all the time, but it is changing mm-hmm. things. Yeah. You know, even the way, like, you know, my, my 17 year old son, right? If he's hungry, he knows how to order on DoorDash, right? right? Like, and that cha- that's changing the restaurant <laughs> business, right? Totally, yeah. But that's okay because other things are, are happening yeah. that are also really powerful. And yeah. it's, it's really about this ability to adapt to how do you build that relationship with customer totally. in changing dynamics. Well, Seth Godin calls it this new relationship economy that we're in. Yep. You know, it's like kind of that fourth. It's totally changing, yeah. yeah. Being the standard bearer for amazing customer experience. <laughs> um, how have you taken that into... Um, other initiatives in your life. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm actually curious uh, about, like, how, the, how does that translate to your everyday life as a consumer? How does it translate to your family life as a mom and wife and, and in the, re- the family relationships? But also, and I, I'd love to hear about how that, how that has in, informed and really influenced your involvement with the Women Tech Council in Utah, which is such a huge part of your life yeah. and it's been such an amazing force for good here in in Utah and you started it. I did. <laughs> and so congratulations yeah, because that's amazing <laughs> and you're thing. seeing like tremendous tremendous things happen. Yep. And so what are some of those things that are happening and how has your your kind of background mm-hmm. empowered those things? You know is We talked a little bit about how there was this kind of catalyst at Disney where it kind of become, for me, the opportunity to kind of be part of that amazing storytelling environment 
just became part of my DNA. And I really do think it changed, it changed the way I operated and viewed the world. Mm. And I've always been kind of acutely aware of wherever I'm at, like, hmm, how are they marketing? Like, how, what's the conversation they're creating? Like, it's just in my DNA, right? I show up, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting that they, you know. I, I feel you. I can't take the glasses off. I can never. I can't. I'm like, there's trash over there. There's wet spots, whatever. You know, like. You're right. One of my favorite pictures was Walt Disney, uh, business pictures, is Walt Disney, this black and white photo, in his suit, picking up trash in Disneyland. Right. Well, and there's just this, like, standard of how it, like, seeps into the way you think about the world. I think the way you interact with people, the expectations yeah. you have of them, and even the way you approach, you know, building companies or employees or people. I like to believe that it made me better at, you know, things, and it taught me things that I hadn't really been, like, maybe thinking as deeply about before. Because you definitely become more aware of how one moment impacts relationship forever, yeah. right? And and the kind of strategy or the thinking and kind of just the fundamental behavior that you should have around relationships with people. Ultimately, the most important thing we do is our relationship with people. And I'm a firm believer that we have a responsibility to figure out how to use our talents to help other people, right? And I think that translates in everything, whether that's in our family, you know, with our spouse relationship or our children's relationship or extended family, community work that we do, employees that we do. Like, I really feel like my job is the people who are around me, am I helping them leverage the talents they have? And am I doing the same thing? Am I using it in such a way that it helps them? You know, and so I, I often say that I have this barometer in my own personal life, which is as I work with people and, you know, we switch projects or we leave companies, mm -hmm. well, those people still want to work with me. Mm. And I really evaluate if I'm doing the right thing as a leader and as um, a person on that team in, um, with those interactions with people. Because if they say, hey, Sid, I'll, like, tell me where you're going next, or I will follow you, then I did a really good job at helping them reach the potential and using the talents that I have to, to make an impact with people. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about how I share my time or where I spend, like, that is part of who I become. And I would tell you that that probably wasn't the leader that I was at when I came out of grad school, mm -hmm. right? And, and all of those experiences le have led me to say, that human connection is super important. So when I evaluate things like how I shape customer experience today, it's in that lens also. Like, what is the thing that you, you expect and the thing that makes that moment more powerful and better than it could have been? Not just because you can do it, but because it's the thing at that moment that makes contextual sense and makes a difference for someone. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and so for me, that translates into things like the Women Tech Council, yeah. right, where you know, we... And we use my software world to like validate everything, right? She's like, oh, we don't know if this is a good idea, but let's go validate it and test it and build and kind of have that theme that goes through my career also. But, you know, the Women Tech Council side, it's always about we're trying to really drive the economic impact of women in tech and address that pipeline that goes from high school all the way to the boardroom. And each one of those audiences have different needs. She Tech, which is the, our high school girls STEM activation program, it's really about how do we help, you know, expand the talent pipeline. And the driver for that is because if diverse teams perform better on revenue and profits, right? They have mm. better use of thought. So for companies wow. worldwide, yeah. the reason that you need diverse thought is because you outperform in revenue and profits, which are the drivers, right? All the good things we're doing that to do good are driven back by that. So we need a bigger pipeline, yeah. right? We only have 5% of female executives in technology, only 23% of the workforce. And so when we go in and talk to those high school girls, they tell us, that 90% of them don't know any women in tech and have no role models. If you have no role models, you really cannot become, for the majority of people, what you can't see. And so the, the power behind that program is, how do we introduce those young women, thousands of them? This year, there's 3,000 girls in the program. How do we help those young women meet role models that they will never meet at home? And the program is so powerful. We have 30% of those girls coming from Title I. It hits every county in, in the state of Utah, so you get all of the rural um, connections. And those young women are choosing STEM because of those experiences. And so, you know, it's just another point of, like, like what is the relationship you're trying they to create? They need a superhero. That's right. Super heroine. That's right. right? You know, and, and how do you give yeah. them an environment that yeah. um, they see themselves become? Yeah, that's a really good translation back to that. And so it's, it, it's kind of woven in that DNA of make experiences that make a difference for someone yeah. and that directly relate to the outcomes that help them, yeah. right? Because when those young women see that I can become this, it's cool. I had one of, them on, one of my student board members on a television segment last week, and she said, um, I, you know, I, I've always liked science, but I was really embarrassed because I liked it because it wasn't normal. 
For us, it's always been about that positive side, mm. right? Around what is it that we collectively change that increases opportunity? Because when we do that, then we get the outcomes that we want. It's amazing, right? The fact that you change the trajectory for someone's life, because what it means for the future of a lot of those girls is an entire different set of opportunities that might not have existed before. And so when they think about contributing to family and community and the environments that they get placed in, it changes what's mm. in front of them. The thing I love most about technology is opportunity it creates. Yeah. Right? Because it's a world where technology is part of every company anyone cares about today. And the ability to show those girls how their talents enable whatever the future is and create more opportunity than they could uh, they thought about before, that's what changes the, the entire economy. It changes culture. It changes families. Right? If we inspire those young women to go pursue something, no matter what life throws at them, their opportunities look different. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. It's important for the entire ecosystem and for the next generations because you've enabled greater opportunity for more people more broadly. Yeah. And it does, to me, it doesn't matter which thing it is. Right? Whatever it is you care about, you should be spending some amount of your time helping the people around you. 100%. It's so inspiring. Yeah. That's a... Yeah, what is what is your your legacy look like? What does that look like for you? Like yeah. when whenever when all is said and done, like what do you want people to say about about you? I definitely think the thing I want, you know, for of all the things that I care most about, it is that it's still grounded in the same thing that I really was trying to help people become the very best that they could mm -hmm. become. I view that in my kids, right? Like my stewardship there is whatever moment that we're dealing with that I'm helping them to get those skills, that they become the very best person they possibly be can become. And the talents that they've been blessed with, they learn how to bless the lives of other people around them and recognize talents in other people, right? And um, of all the other things, right, that we all like to talk about, right, whether it's wealth or family or things like that, at the end of the day, it is the relationships you create with people and the impact that you have on doing good for people around you. you know, so oftentimes, I don't think I have enough time to do all the things that you know come to your mind about <laughs> how you should help people. Yeah. But I do try to operate that way, yeah. you know, with people who work for me, with my family, with my kids, like um, spending that time. As you think through and and you're in a space of bringing on new clients to help them embrace better this idea of making a difference in the world, of creating impact, you're helping inspire them, you're having conversations with them about what they can do to create these great and better experiences, yeah. enhanced experiences. Uh, for anyone that feels like it may be a little bit too much, or a little bit tough to do, um, what's one thing that they could do in the next day to even just dial it up just a little bit? What's one thing that you would suggest a leader do? So. When you, come, when you talk about changing culture and trying to understand experience, the very best place to start is how we ourselves interact with the people around us, Ooh, yeah. right? So uh, for me, the challenge would be, when was the last time you flipped it around and either like asked someone else how to solve the problem versus solving it for them, mm. right? Or asked everyone from in every, you know, or even just the, the interaction that you have from someone who's manning your front desk to someone who's, you know, helping you with your schedule, like or maybe there the is, or maybe the custodian, or anyone that you run into, yeah. right? I think the challenge for us is to both acknowledge and appreciate every person that mm -hmm. you run into, oh. and in some way um, drive an interaction that's not about us but about them, because oftentimes as leaders we're really busy and we, and we often know answers to things, which sometimes mean we forget about the other side of the recognition and the contribution of all of the people in every position and in everywhere in life, right? It doesn't actually matter if they work for you or not. And I think when we start thinking others first, us second, in those interactions, it changes our perspective about all of those things. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I really look forward to sharing this with, with people. I think I know that it will be completely inspiring. Special thanks to our host, Rico Cosina, for creating the ideal place for us to talk about breakthrough culture, brand experience, and human connection. The atmosphere, the smells, and the taste were an incredible experience. You know, they make tortillas so good that businesses all over Utah serve them. And I love that I was there for Sid's first Al Pastor taco ever. Join the taco journey on my website. You are not going to want to miss out on the resources, courses, and of course, the national taco tour I'm planning when I launch the book, 
search for The Perfect Taco. So follow me on social media, subscribe to my channel, and tune in to another episode of Taco Incidents, where we'll continue to explore the secrets to level up your culture, brand experience, human connection, and your taco game. Okay, just throwing this in here. El Pilon. I'm going to go carnitas first. Go on carnitas um, first? Yep. Uh, how's the pastor? It's really good. Is it? Mm-hmm. On the Chilean side I is... really like the pineapple in there. It was like... Yeah. Have you never had pineapple on well, the I haven't, before? I don't know if I've ever actually had a pastor one. Yes! <laughs> I'm so, so happy right now. It's really good. Yeah. Oh.